Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection, of course. Today's topic are Seifert surfaces, a very nice, well, very nice geometrical concept surfaces associated to knots. We will actually see what that means. And actually, um, there will also be soap films. It's kind of a lot of fun. So uh, fasten your seat belts for a very nice run through kind of a lot of interesting concepts in topology and combinatorics. So and the main theorem today will be kind of the existence of those surfaces together with uh, the corresponding construction, which is a little bit surprising that they actually exist if you just think about uh, a certain knot. I will show you an example, a very scary example actually. But before going to that example, let's just jump right into it. So just to be on the same page here, Seifert surfaces will be a certain type of surface. I mean that topologically. So what does it mean? Well, a surface is certainly just a two-dimensional object. So here are some examples of surfaces. Um, a sphere, top one here, a torus, or this is actually also a sphere. And all of these I have boundary, and I'm interested in this line, so uh, surfaces with boundary. And actually all of them are topologically the same. So all of them are topologically the same. You can kind of see that. So topologically speaking, we're only up for continuous deformations. So I don't care about area or whatever. Just take your surface, take off as it's being made out of rubber or something, and you can deform it continuously. For example, going just from the first one to the last one would just be to kind of poke a little, well, not really poke a hole, but kind of press it down um, such that you get from the flat one to the, to the cup, right? So this is kind of the same surface here, and I'm interested in those surfaces. And kind of the first, kind of question you could ask is how can I distinguish surfaces? Well, it's not so easy. For example, this funny coffee mock here, um, which just has this, well, just call me Taurus because the coffee mock is actually a Taurus. I will run the usual animation. Everything is of course linked in the description uh, in a second for you. Um, but before let's, let's think about it for a second. So what I'm not interested in, well, let me re repeat that. What I'm not interested in are kind of area or other properties, or as you can see here, whether it's actually forms a square or whether it's a circle is not really the point here. The point is kind of locally, the surface should be uh, an R squared, unless you have the boundary, so let's ignore the boundary. And so here locally, you actually see a plane, or let's say a open neighborhood of R squared. So like, like, a, like a disc, and um, that's just what you want locally. And then there's some global, property and you want them up to continuous deformation. So let's say up to homeomorphism, if you know what that means. And the example is a torus in this case, which is just the coffee mock, which is continuous deformation of the coffee mock. If I, as I'm going to uh, explain now, just we we'll just look at the GIF, so the animation, and then it's kind of clear. So here's the usual animation in the setup. Um, the torus continuously deforms into a coffee mock. It's pretty, pretty simple. But kind of the only thing that counts here is that the torus um, has a hole. Um, yeah, so torus, uh, torus is just a donut. It's not quite a donut, actually. It's a hollow donut, so it's more like a swim ring or something, and you can continuously deform it into a coffee mug. That's why topology, that's kind of the underlying field of mathematics we are discussing here, is also called what, rubber geometry. It's really like you just think of your object, whatever kind of object you like to study, in this case, a two-dimensional object, the surface, as being made of rubber and you're allowed to deform it continuously without tearing it. And what is absolutely not clear here is, are, are there any interesting, uh, intrinsic, not interesting, they are pretty, there are a lot of interesting properties of surfaces, but intrinsic properties of surfaces, namely um, ones that you can just read off from the surface, it can't be something like the area because the area certainly changes. Um, so if I would like, so this surface here, I would think of it as filled, it's the top one here. Um, it's the same as any kind of scaling of the surface or so a bigger one or a smaller one, they're all the same. So area or something like area or angles or something, you just can't use that as an intrinsic property. And it's not quite clear whether there should be any intrinsic property, but there are quite a lot of intrinsic properties that help you to distinguish um, your surfaces. So for, for example, you could think of it for a second, it's not answered in this video, but um, kind of this hole here is the hole that defines the torus in some sense, but in some sense it's not quite true best because there's another hole, um, the hole that kind of, this kind of this empty 
inside, so not really here inside, but inside it's empty. There's another hole and the torus here has also two holes. It has a hole that goes around like this and it has a hole that goes around like this. And that would be an intrinsic property of the surface, but to define that, that's a little bit hard. So let's use a, to really honestly define it, not just a little bit hand waving. So let's use a different, a different intrinsic property, which is called orientability. And orientability is actually quite a nice concept. So remember, we would think about surfaces and at each point of the surface, you can associate a coordinate system because locally, as I said, a surface is just um, a disk or a subset of R2. So locally, we can just associate to each point a coordinate system. And in order to do this, we kind of want to distinguish the two. So we can, in this illustration, for example, one of them gets a dot and one of them gets an arrow. So there's really a choice of coordinate system. And an orientation is then a consistent choice of this coordinate system as you walk along the surface. So you walk along the surface as down here on my Möbius strip. So you walk along the Möbius strip and you kind of continuously change the coordinate system. It goes all the way to the back here um, and it's on the back and comes up at the front here again. And kind of the point is you can't really do that. As you can see, these have kind of swapped. So you can't consistently choose a coordinate system without kind of reversing orientation on the Möbius strip. And such surfaces are called non-orientable surfaces or manifolds in general. Manifolds just a higher dimensional version of surface if you want. And these are the ones we don't want. And these are kind of the ones that you could easily construct associated to knots as we will see on the next slide. No, 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 we only want orientable surfaces and orientable being orientable or not is really an intrinsic property. It doesn't change um, if you do some rubber geometry on your surface. So that's what you want. You want an orientable surface, kind of a fun fact, kind of a life prefers orientable things. So the Möbius strip was discovered pretty late. Actually, it's a really, really simple construction. You just take a strip of paper and you glue the two ends or two ends of them together in an orientation reversing way. So this, this point here upstairs goes to this point downstairs. And if you do that, you glue it, you get this little twist here, as you can see it in this picture. And this kind of ruins it. It kind of makes it non-orientable. It's a very nice, nice idea. It took a very long time to be discovered. So we're talking about 1850 something ish year uh, for such a simple surface. Uh, a sphere was of course known much, much longer. And kind of the point is, this is a little bit hand wavy of course, but um, na nature prefers kind of orientable surfaces. We'll see that actually later. So stay tuned. So. Well, from this slide, all I wanted to say is I'm interested in those orientable surfaces. I don't want Möbius strips. I don't want fancy versions of Möbius strips. No, I want orientable surfaces. And the question the Seifert addressed um, must have been in the 1920s, so it's about 100 years ago. It's a very cute question, maybe 1930s. It's the following. So you have a knot, and the knot is really something simple, or in general, a link doesn't really matter. So if you have a knot, let's say here, my little knot, it's a three-dimensional object. It's an embedding of a circle in three space, and it can be really knotted, hence the name knot. And usually you study it via projection, and this is really a cute picture. So the projection, the projection really depends on the on the angle where you kind of project your knot to, to the plane, right? I say it again, knot is actually an object in three space, and a knot projection is an object that can draw something like this here, uh, and you just Kind of just keep track of over and under crossing. So what crosses over and what crosses under. And if you have some free time, by the way, this object here is just the unknot. So this is a very, very strange projection of just the circle. So the unknot is called, the circle is called the unknot. It's, it's a knot, not knotted, not knotted, whatever, a, a circle just in three space. And if you just turn it in rubber geometry, right, we can, we can rubber it around, just push it around and then project it in a really bad way, you could, could end with such a really strange projection, uh, which is called a demon knot. Uh, so it's an unknot. It's a really, really bad projection of the unknot. So actually um, knots are not as simple as you think they are. They are pretty complicated objects in some sense, but they're just very easily defined. They're just circles that you somehow put in three space um, or multiple circles. And the task kind of uh, Seifert wanted to wanted to ask here is, well, and not as again, one of those rubber geometry objects. So can we find some intrinsic properties that kind of distinguishes this knot here? So this crazy projection 
um, it's just the unlocked. So there should be something we can associate to the crazy projection if you want. And if you just analyze it carefully enough, we should be able to figure out that this crazy beast here is actually the unlocked, which is a non-trivial task, as you can, as you can see. I, I personally never tried to undo this. I just trust the author of the source where I stole it from, and that this is really the unlocked. But there's a very well-known theorem um, which says that any knot, or the unknot at least, or any knot actually, then in the end has kind of has weird projections. Let me just formulate it like this a little bit, a hand wavy, of course. And what I want here is a so called ciphered surface. Namely, I want a surface really in this sense. Uh, as you can see here, the boundary here is really, is really a knot, a very trivial one, of course, just a knot here as well, here as well. And I want a surface that has a, as a knot as a boundary. And it should be oriental and should bound the knot. And this isn't all that trivial. I will show you some really, really cute animations or cute pictures in a second. So if I have just a circle, of course, I can just bound it. Uh, I can just find a surface that bounds it, maybe just a disk. But if you have something more fancy, like, like this one here, it's actually not so clear how to do this. And in particular, you need to be careful that you're not constructing any Mobius strips here. So it's absolutely uh, not clear how to do that. And the main theorem is actually you can do it. It's kind of a very funny, very funny way of doing it. So these cipher surfaces, as you can see here, they are pretty complicated surfaces in general. And the point is they exist. You can actually show that they exist and you can construct them algorithmically. You can construct the one with a minimal uh, number of holes algorithmically. I show you a very nice uh, video in a second um, how those really look like. But the way to construct them is as follows. You can put do that on this knot, it just, just takes you a while. But in principle, it's just an algorithm. So you have your knot. This one is a little bit easier, maybe here. Uh, so your projection. And there's an orientation. And you just use the orientation to do the following. So in an oriented picture like this, so each crossing locally is some orientation. And there's one easy way to make it easier to just right, to just re, uh, relocate your your connections and locally you just do this operation, which is really non-topological in nature, but let's just do that. And of course, because you have undone all crossings, you end up with a picture like this without any crossings. And what you should do now is you think you should think of these as being little platforms here. So one, two, and here's another one, maybe a little bit like a like a, a bean or something, like a kit day. Um, and then you just connect them along the crossings using these twists here. So you would connect, so here, so we have uh, undone two crossings here and here, and we have undone two crossings here and here. So we would connect them with those little twist surfaces, right? To fill them with uh, with the surface. This is kind of the trivial filling. It's something you can always do. And then you kind of twist, connect them with those little twist things. And here were two others, and you end up with ex ex exactly one of those Zeifert surfaces that looks like this. So it's a, it's a grayish surface in the middle of the of the knot. And that's actually an orientable surface of the minimal genus that bounds the knot. It's pretty cool and simple construction, right? I say it again, just look at your projection, do the only kind of operation you can really easily do uh, locally on the crossings, just get rid of them. It's always, always good, always a good idea. Get rid of complicated things. Um, you get a connection of circles, you fill the circles with the only surface you know that is really easy, namely the surface uh, the circles are filled with well, the obvious surface, and then connect them via those little twists. OK, and these things really appear in nature. They actually, we'll see that in a second. I'm running the video, beautiful video, YouTube video linked in the description. I run that in a second. They actually arise as uh, minimal surfaces, namely uh, via soap bubbles or via soap films. So you can use um, soap films to create surfaces. I will show you in a mathematical demonstration in a second. And because of the tension, this, the surface Usually, it's a soap film, right? It, it wants to break, so it kind of tries to minimize tension, and you get um, kind of funny surfaces, which are called minimal surfaces. They have the minimal kind of area because you want to minimize the tension. Um, that's kind of very nice, and they rise in nature. And because they rise in nature, they are automatically orientable. So, um, kind of fun fact is then if you use kind of this, this knot as as your soap film, whatever it is, so a soap film outer part thing. <laughs> Very good description, soap filled auto part thing. And then whatever kind of surface you get, the uh, soap film tries to minimize tension, will be a cipher surface. Pretty cool. But first of all, let's run some Mathematica. 
So here's Mathematica code. And in this case, I would like to have kind of a minimal surface between two rings. So a ring outside here and a ring inside. And as you can see, it's kind of what it's what is expected, right? It kind of kind of minimizes the, the tension. It, it's, it's not a cylinder, it's kind of a street cylinder. And you can increase the diameter here. You could, oh, at one point, it will just break apart because the tension is just too big. And this would be the minimal surface. So you can really imagine that this is kind of a soap foam. Um, you could just little, play a little bit around with it. At one point, it will break. But roughly, this is what I have in mind. A soap film in this case would be for two circles. And now let's do something a little bit more fancy. Here's the promised uh, YouTube video linked in the description. It's really beautiful. So let's just run it. So it's really the same idea with soap bubbles or with soap films. So um, the typical Zephyr surface I already showed you. This is half to expense, kind of a cool idea. And this is how it works really in nature. So nature constructs these. So this is the one I had on my slide. It's the one for the Taurus and uh, sorry for the for the trefoil well easy not and actually you can really realize them as soap film they're really really beautiful here you can see it it's it's, it's amazing um you need to get rid of some of the fluctuations here and this is the cypher surface it's really really cool okay it doesn't <laughs> doesn't hold last that long it's soap film it's real life this is another one right these little platforms that i explained and the corresponding soap bubble is really really beautiful there you go oh it's so amazing and this is the orientable cipher surface. Um, as I said, you need to get rid of some of the fluctuations that arise here uh, carefully. And there you go. Oh, so beautiful. Uh, Zyphert surface for the figure eight knot via soap firms. Okay, great. So let me wrap up. So Zyphert surfaces, this really, really nice idea of associating an orientable surface uh, to a knot such that the surface bounds or not. And it's not quite clear how to construct them, but actually nature constructs them for us. I think Seifert was, I'm not sure whether Seifert was aware of this, but actually nature constructs them for us uh, via those soap films, so soap bubbles as minimal surfaces, minimizing the tension. Um, the algorithm is exactly, Seifert's algorithm, the original algorithm is exactly what nature does. It's pretty, pretty impressive. And the main theorem remember for today was that those things always exist and the existence was just proven by nature itself, which I find pretty cool. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.